Good afternoon or good morning to everyone based on where you're logging in from. Um, this is a webinar from the Adolescent Health Initiative on confidentiality, best practices, and adolescent health. My name is Kaylee Cornelson, and I'm a program specialist with AHI. I'm going to be your moderator, question taker, technology person um, for the webinar today. And I am joined by a really amazing panel of folks from across the country. Um, you'll get to know each one of them um, as we go through the webinar today, and you can see their names and credentials and where they work um, on this first screen. Um, so a little bit about the webinar today. Um, this webinar came out of all of the questions that we get um, in our work at AHI around confidentiality best practices when it comes to serving adolescents. And we especially get questions about um, explanations of benefits, um, EHR use, billing, and so you will see that our presenters today, um, several of them will kind of touch on those particular topics and speak to some of the innovative things that they've been doing in those areas, everything from practice to policy, which is very exciting. Um, the structure of the webinar today, we're going to go over some confidentiality best practices just in general. Then you'll hear from three panelists who are going to talk about their innovative work in confidentiality. And then we'll have a good amount of time for questions from the audience. So please feel free at any time to type in your questions um, into the GoToWebinar uh, portal or the dashboard, I guess you could call it. Um, and I will be moderating those questions and we'll take all of those at the end. But don't feel like you have to wait to type them in. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna tell you first just a little bit about the Adolescent Health Initiative. Um, we provide training, technical assistance, coaching um, to healthcare providers, health systems and organizations across the country. And our goal really is to improve adolescent-centered care. And our vision is to transform the healthcare landscape to optimize adolescent and young adult health and well-being. We do this through a lot of different avenues. Um, we have tons of free resources on our website and you can see that listed at the bottom of the slide. Um, but we also do that through our adolescent-centered environment assessment process, as well as our adolescent champion model. Um, and you can read, like I said, more about all of those items on our website or contact me if you have additional questions. Um, and we like to show this beautiful map of the United States because the dark blue represents all of the states that we've either worked in in the past or are currently working in. And so we're really proud of um, the ability to have touched so many different um, lives throughout our work. So here are our objectives for the webinar today. We're gonna to review the importance of confidential services for adolescent patients. Um, we'll discuss best practices in providing confidential services. And then, like I said, we're going to dig deeper into some of those innovative examples of confidentiality practices from our three panelists um, and then provide opportunities for you all to ask questions of the folks on the panel. With that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Chulani, who is the Section Chief of Adolescent Medicine at Phoenix Children's Hospital and the Medical Director of Phoenix Children's Gender Supportive Services. He's also an associate professor of pediatrics in the Department of Child Health at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. And his clinical research, uh, his clinical and research interests include adolescent sexual and reproductive health, health equity promotion, and the care of gay, lesbian, bisexual, tra transgender, and questioning youth. And he's my uh, clinical consultant for our adolescent champion model in the state of Arizona. Uh, with that, Vinny, I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thanks, Kaylee, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. So I'd like to begin by, you know, this slide that really talks about why confidentiality matters for teenagers. Adolescence is such a remarkable time of physical and psychosocial change. And it's important for us who care for and about youth to recognize that this is a very rich and nuanced process, and the process and outcomes of which are the result of, of the interaction between adolescent hosts and their environment. It's also important that we view adolescence as developmentally necessary 
and that we recognize that for the vast majority of adolescents, adolescence is not the period of storm and stress that we often make it out to be. In fact, most adolescents navigate this developmental period successfully, as did most of us. Adolescence, however, can also be a period of unique vulnerability. As youth explore their environments around them, they may engage in risk behaviors that are related to sex, to substances, to interpersonal interactions, and emotional health that are reflected in the most common causes of morbidity and mortality for the age group. It's critical that we not view these behaviors in isolation, but we view these behaviors in the context of adolescents navigating their developmental processes and the environments, structures, supports, and systems that surround them. Now, these topics are not exactly easy for adolescents to talk about, at least not without assurances of confidentiality. Next slide. Okay. Now, guidelines for adolescent health supervision emphasize the role of healthcare providers in screening for risk behaviors, in assessing youth and how they navigate these developmental processes. In practice, however, research suggests that only a fraction of adolescents receive this screening or actually have the opportunity to engage in meaningful conversations with their providers about these behaviors. In fact, many adolescents do not view their primary care providers as a source of confidential care. Now, confidentiality truly matters for youth, and youth are more likely to engage in these critical conversations with their healthcare providers and seek services when provided assurances of confidentiality. Now, we must also acknowledge that physicians and healthcare providers come to this work and meet adolescents with the best of intentions. Research suggests, however, that we as a group are often limited by our knowledge of state laws regarding minor consent and confidentiality, or we are sometimes limited in how we apply these constructs and concepts and laws to our visits with youth. Now, I've also worked with medical students and residents for almost two decades, and a very frequent question I get is, when do I have this time to visit with adolescent in private? When do I begin to do this? My message has always been that we apply this practice uniformly to all adolescents to the extent that they are comfortable doing so, beginning in early adolescence. Because unless we apply this standard and this practice uniformly, we expose ourselves to our biases, implicit and otherwise, and we treat different groups of youth differently. Will you then you know, we, we, have, we have differing perceptions of risk according to youth's racial and ethnic identities, according to their social identities, according to their social economic groups, according to their gender and sexual groups. And it's important to be mindful that there are biases and stereotypes that surround these identities, which makes applying the practice consistent across groups of young people. Providing confidential care and having these critical conversations with youth has its challenges. Many of us feel uncomfortable or lack training or feel poorly prepared to have these conversations. Now, we also know that it takes resources and time and sometimes our staffing models and the time constraints that we often have to deal with in clinical practice limit us. We also practice in imperfect systems where our processes related to billing and exploitation of benefits, how our electronic medical record systems and parents' access to patient portals may limit our ability to provide confidential care and keep good on our assurances of confidentiality to young people. Let's take some time to go over some best practices in providing confidential care. First, informing adolescents in opening our conversations with youth by informing them of confidentiality productions and their limits. Everything we talk about here stays between us other than, and there's many different ways to say it. If you're suicidal, homicidal, or in an abusive situation, if you're a danger to yourself, if you're a danger to others, or in a situation you're, where you might be in danger because of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, I think it's really important to be able to have that script down and to be able to deliver that script 
that very clearly explains to young people at the very outset of that conversation about confidentiality and, and its limits. It's important to recognize that it can be extremely damaging to trust and relationship building with youth should you then later in the conversation find yourself in a position of having to disclose sensitive information which was obtained privately with youth if the limits were not first disclosed with young people. Informing youth about, confident, about confidentiality practices can also serve as an educational opportunity as many teens are not necessarily aware of confidentiality protections and the scope of services that they can access without the consent of their parents and guardians. It's also important to think about the many other ways that we might be able to convey this information to young people, including nonverbal ways such as hanging wall posters and providing this information in patient handouts that, that really go through confidentiality laws in ways that are understandable to young people. One of the things I love to talk about is how we partner with parents. It's important to recognize that parents and guardians are not the enemy, that parents are themselves adjusting to parenting teenagers just as teenagers are adjusting to being teenagers. Recognize that teens do best when they come from a place of communication and connectedness with their parents and caregivers. Parenting communication and connectedness is incredibly it is incredibly resilience promoting for young people. In our work with parents and youth, there are strategies that we can apply to bridge this, this period and really foster parent and teen communication and connectedness. Some of the strategies that we might use when working with, with parents and teens that come in for their visits, one is to normalize the expectation that you will meet with the adolescents alone and, or at least yearly. And there's many different ways to convey this information to parents. Out there, you will actually find samples of letters that introduce parents to this concept, either as part of welcome packets to their clinics or just something that they share with parents as their teenagers get into the teenage years about the importance of spending time alone with young people. And there's many ways to frame this positively as well. One strategy I use is I, it, when I go into the visit is I ask, how old is Johnny? 17? Well, you know what? Very soon, he's going he's gonna to become an adult. He won't be 17 forever. At one point, he will have to be a, the, the keeper of his own health and his independent decision maker, and we'd like for him to be able to start now. To be able to validate the parental role and to be able to elicit any questions or concerns parents may have before spending that time together. I say things like, yes, you know, I recognize that you're growing up and you never stop meeting your parents, but it's also important to spend time alone with young people during this period. To, to, view, to view this as, as a way to also validate some of the concerns and fears of, of parents of being excluded. Sometimes there are strategies that you can do to make adolescents the center of the visit. When meeting with patient and parent, for example, parents together, for example, directing questions directly to the parent, to the patient while appreciating parental input. Oftentimes when I'm taking a history about physical complaints, tell me about your headache, the parent jumps in. What do I do? I repeat the question. I repeat the question and give the young person the opportunity to answer while ignoring the, the, the answer that the parent may have provided unless it really supplants and adds clinically important information. There are some additional best practices with regards to insurance and informing young people about potentials for breaches of the assurance of confidentiality that we give them. One is in the explanation of benefits that their patient, that their parents or guardians may receive if they access confidential services, especially if they are covered under private insurance. In Arizona, for example, our state Medicaid plan does not send the explanations of benefits out to, to beneficiaries, but our private insurances do. One option that we use um, in, in such situations 
is we share with young people information on clinics that are either titled pen clinics where they can access sensitive services confidentially or clinics that offer free services or that have sliding scale programs that they can access independent independent of their parents insurance coverage this slide lists some of the best practices to really support confidentiality for young people first as we talked about informing young people about confidentiality protections and their limits being able to obtain a cell number to be able to contact young people directly and to be able to standardize this in your system where you can contact young people for their test results. Making sure that we standardize the practice of spending time alone with adolescents, using a workflow that allows for confidential completion of risk screening tools. In many of our practices, we have screeners such, such as uh, you know, those that you will find in, in uh, GAPS, for example, the guidelines for adolescent preventive services, for example, has uh, questionnaires on risk behaviors that young people can complete ahead of their time with the provider, which allows providers to then direct their time together towards the areas of concern for young people. One of the challenges we see, however, is oftentimes young people complete these questionnaires in waiting rooms in the presence of their parents, which can certainly impede the kind of honesty with which they um, complete these screeners. Being able to instate universal chlamydia and SDI screening. Currently, recommendations are for young women below the, under the age of 24 who are sexually active to receive chlamydia screening annually or as often as might be required according to risk levels. The challenge with this recommendation, however, is it, 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 it makes, it points it out to young people, it points it out to parents and guardians that young people were sexually active if, if screening was not done universally. One strategy to normalize this and not inadvertently disclose where young people are in their sexual development is to instate universal chlamydia screening. To be able to keep an updated list of referral resources, such as uh, clinics which offer free services or Title 10 services, is another best practice. Being able to train all staff and providers and practices, policies, legal protections, and limitations so that we create a culture within our clinical spaces that really upholds and protects and supports adolescents' access to confidential health services. And lastly, being able to convey an environment of confidentiality by using privacy screens at check-in, using white noise machines, especially in areas where, where our spaces are small or our sound barriers aren't so good, to make sure that we provide young people confidential in, um, environments where they can that, that facilitate disclosure. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that overview of best practices. Um, anything else to add before we move into our examples? All right. So our next presenter, this is when we're going to get into some innovative examples of confidentiality best practices. So our first presenter on this today is Dr. Maria Veronica Savitas. She is a cisgender immigrant Latinx family medicine physician at Hannafin Healthcare Department of Family and Community Medicine and faculty at the Leadership Education and Adolescent Health Department of General Peds at the University of Minnesota. Originally from Argentina, she designed and directs a key parity here for you youth development program since 2002, funded by the Eliminating Health Disparities Initiative grant from the Minnesota Department of Health. Dr. Savitas also deployed a system-wide program called Huntington, now renamed Between Us, an initiative that we will learn more about today. The research focus is on parenting Latinx adolescents, transition of care, and health equity for teens. She is currently the chair of SAM's Diversity Committee and is a part of several initiatives on health equity and immigration across Minnesota. Now I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. So you will be hearing me talking and I hope my accent doesn't get in the way. And if not, you say something there. You type a message and say, slow down, lady. So such a pleasure to be here. And my mission today is to share with you like a journey, like a story about 
how we become between us and how we started trying to connect parents, teen and healthcare, doing that at the crossroad or a safety net hospital or a hospital serving the mission of a safety net and primary care. And next slide, please. So most of system-wide changes are born, right, from a clinical innovation, and that happens to us. And usually it's sound provider listening carefully to the needs of our patient, and that's exactly what happened here in, in Minneapolis. Like, we were aware we were having a key parati here for you ongoing for around seven years, and suddenly electronic health record came on board. And when we were asking them, like, so what's, what's next? How do we... How do we handle this? How we put these practices? How, how do we translate those practices into the electronic health record? We figured it out like there was a gap and a need. So in a key part of tea, next slide. Next, there you go. So we were born as a family center and developed mentally and culturally appropriate healthcare home, right? And with that, we have like very clear pillars that you can see on the next slide, where bringing the inclusion of our cultural values, we make sure that th that cultural responsibility translated into preferences for our families that we were caring for. And that meant that we were going to include the cultural values of our families in the process of providing care. So some of that were having a family-centered care. It's what we developed, it's something called parallel care or now called also intergenerational care. And we were tackling adolescents. So I have a, a phrase that it's adolescence happens to the family, right? It's this pendulum, like one piece needing more independence and the other being affected the parents because they need to change the, the way that they parent are, and they coach their teens. So we were doing that, but it was anchored in very strong confidentiality care. And we so, have so far developed a, a system on doing that, where we kind of put all the parent, parent and teens together, and we were going to explain, we explained to them what it meant, right? How the care that they were going to receive was probably different than the one that they were used to. And we developed what we call a confidentiality mantra which is sort of like the regular mantra that we use in confidentiality, but we added a new paragraph. And that new paragraph was targeting the parent, right? Like, like Dr. Shulani was saying, like, I want you to know, like, this is not against you. This is done to support you. I want you to be your partner. And I want you to be the other significant adult in your child. So supporting your work with this child. And we wanted to make sure in a key party that we convey that message because we knew as immigrant parents, there was a huge need that we have recorded in Minneapolis and through several, and her, through several sources. So we knew like those parents were desperate for help and we needed to provide support for them at the same time. And with that, we invited them to one room uh, where the parent coach was going to work with the parents and the other room where the provider was going to work with the team. And we made sure, like, we would have, like, one room in the middle, <laughs> so just in case, to make sure like, we, we create the ambience, right? That safe space that our team needed. So what, need, what happened at that moment when the e electronic health record came into our clinic, which was epic, was the following. And we can show them in the next slide how we, at that moment, the call Genetin we sort of like started these processes of creating a multidisciplinary task force. And so we put together people from all over the hospital and different silos, and we started talking about this need. And we created epic modification, and we piloted those epic modifications. And since then, when we started piloting through our, extending from our Akiparati program, which is a clinic within a clinic, to the whole clinic, East Lake Clinic, we felt like people were asking, we want that too. And at that moment, we felt like, most of you will realize, like when we put like a system-wide initiative for around confidentiality or about teen healthcare, we need training, and we need to make sure that what I call the other healthcare disparity, meaning like somehow teens have gotten 
kind of like erase from the population health pyramid. Sometimes when, when people are designing hospital or healthcare system, that we were going to incorporate training because we know like in primary care, primary care provider from all different specialties didn't have enough training around that. So at that moment, we thought we need a grant. And we were so lucky, so lucky and privileged to be able to have from the Minnesota Department of Health, the Family Planning Special Project Grant, who allow us to put a program coordinator and do that, do the training from clerks, the call center and the providers on, on their own, uh, on the, developing the skills that they needed to have to create that, uh, again, ambience, climate that we need to ensure like a team feels safe and that they can share all the things that they need to share with us in a confidential way. And through the years when we were doing us, we were doing all this training, we got to the point that we felt okay now that we have Genetin was an amazing name for our hospital, right? Genepin <laughs> healthcare systems. But when we went into outreach at things outside, that name didn't resonate with them, right? So we created an AUPA white part use project action research oriented to create this new identity and they come up with the name when we explain to them what we wanted to do they say it's between us and that's people in the next slide you're going to see how between us was born and i love to call it uh, between us formerly known as genetin and i usually do that on purple to honor prince in minneapolis so but that's who we come we become and through the process from the beginning, the inception of Between Us or Genetin, we made sure we wanted to replicate the main values that make a Kiperati so successful. So in the next slide, you're going to see kind of like the main between us, between us pillars. And we have three main pillars, right? Adolescent confidentiality and teen friendliness, elements of a family planning clinic within a primary care setting, parent education and support. And we did that, you'll see, we'll talk about the first slide in the next, first pillar in the next slide, because we have this vision of having like this universal protocol for teens seeking confidential care, where we have this system-wide, organizational-wide, protocol that in the electronic medical record era, everyone was going to be trained, call center, clerical staff, healthcare provider, nursing staff, and they would be able to know how to provide confidential services, ensuring that documentation at the encounter was set differently, information was not going to be able to be released without the team consent, labs were identified as confidential, Confidential meds given during the visit or sent as prescription were identified as confidential and the billing were going to be protected. So no explanation of benefits was going to be sent out and that we make sure like the after visit summary was also going to be confidential. And we were lucky enough, as you're going to see in the next slide, that Minnesota has like an ample, uh, Minnesota minor consent laws are really um, broad. So we are able to, to care for in the sexual, sexual health, right? Pregnancy-related care, contraceptive care, and sexually transmitted infection testing and treatment. And with our grant, we have another mental health set of confidential pieces that we can do, but we decided to tackle first the sexual health pieces to go to move this forward. And so we initiated a system transformation that we'll see in the next slide, and that will show to you first the thing that we have done with electronic healthcare transformation. So with this committee uh, where we have IT, labs, pharmacy, medical records, lawyers, and representations from nurses and physicians from the three primary specialty, right? I think we have like OBGYN, our PEDS, family medicine, uh, and internal medicine. We created this robust protection or system uh, inside of the electronic health record where we were able to include, for example, whenever we were having a confidential visit, we have like this private encounter banner, like it's on red. So you're opening that, that visit, it's able to be shared and see by any physician in the system, 
but it's going to be having a red banner allowing you to know like, that information is sensitive. And one of the things that I love the most is this patient chart advisory. When you, whenever you open a chart that belongs to a 12 to 17 year old, something will pop up saying to you, be aware, your patient is a teenager and there might some confidentiality rules that might apply. And we have like a very brief kind of summary of what are the confidentiality uh, things that are protected in Minnesota that somehow can be customized in different states, right? And then we have this confidential minor smart set. I'm going to talk a little about that first, which, which I truly love, like where you go there and you have all your sets of everything possible, right? Like labs, medication and referrals that can be confidential. And when you are ordering those, it's called confidential smart set and you need to order those things inside of that. Because that smart set somehow guides the other pieces. I always think about electronic health record as like this kaleidoscope, right? Like when you have like, it's multifaceted. So you have one thing here triggering all things on the other side. So that allow us to, for the lab to know these things are confidential, do not send the results to home. These allow us to put like medication to the pharmacy. This is confidential, be aware of that. Sign that, signal that to the providers too. But also allow to us to create the other piece. It was first than this one. It's called the best practice advisory. So let's say like I'm in the midst of the day and I forgot about confidentiality because healthcare is gets crazy, right? And and I put chlamydia during screening in a blink of an eye. The system will stop me if I didn't use the confidential minor smart set, and they will ask me, this might be a confidential order. Do you like to convert that to confidential or not? And you can troubleshoot. And so through that, we have this confidentiality statement on orders, and we were able to create an after-visit summary that will filter all the, everything that it was included in the smart set was signaled as filterable, right? For this um, after visit summary. And then magic happened, right? When my chart came to the institution, it came far later than that. I don't remember if it's, like, we adopted it 2011, 2010. But what happened is we have champions in each department and people were trained. So we didn't have to fight the my chart piece. Someone came to us and said, hey, my chart is coming. And from 12 to 17 it's going to be for minors only so they are the one that are going to be owning and governing my chart so if you want to learn more about that you will see in the next slide uh, we have a whole presentation that it's for epic users only um, and but i'm going to share a little secret that i discovered one day looking at my epic screen uh probably hopelessly <laughs> wrestling with time and it, something captured my attention. There was an earth there. And I'm like, what is an earth doing in that icon? When you go to your epic, open it up and go to your screen. It's on the right upper corner. I cannot share any epic screen by epic regulations. But if you go to that and you click on that, you'll discover social media for epic users, people. Um, we, when I found that out, and with between us full in place, we were able to promote, I will say, the adolescent confidentiality cost. And we recruited people from PITS, family medicine and internal medicine. And with that, we were able kind of to push EPIC to create its own adolescent health, adolescent medicine steering board. So when you click on EPIC Earth and on that icon, the Earth, the social media opens up called Epic Earth. You browse Adolescent Medicine Steering Committee and voila, board. And it's all there. And on the left column, look for my picture. It's all blurred, but you can see it there. And the name of the presentation is Genetin, Providing Confidential Care to Minor. You have like 30 minutes recorded presentation to me, like it's a state of the art, two of our amazing providers at that moment that were part of building Genetin and particularly Jennifer O'Brien, both are there uh, on this presentation. We did it on EPIC in 2015. I think it will walk you through with EPIC screens through this. And in the next piece, I'm going to briefly talk about the other pillar, 
parent and education, parent education and support. So we built as part of Between Us as the initiative, this piece with a website, and you're going to see that down there, it's the betweenushealth.org website for parents, that is coming soon in Spanish through workshops. We have our parent coach sort of like doing is that easy uh, in Spanish for or in English for Latino and non-Latino um, adolescents, uh, parents of adolescents, mainly to help them to to become more familiar and to do some sort of like community work where we work on the myth around contraception and about confidentiality. And as you can see on the next slide, we sort of like put together the confidentiality mantra that we built for Akiparati. We put it on work. On So this is the brochure that we distribute for parents and informing parents about what we do. So we there, we put it together and we wrote Kadakar Mantra inviting them to join our work to create healthier and safer teens. And just so you know, talking about confidentiality or giving someone something to read about confidentiality have almost the same effect and the same change. So just per se, the, the, the act of talking, 50% uh, of the parents will shift their, their perception about the need and the why. And in the next slide, it's sort of like, our last pillar, and I cannot stress this pillar more. And it's the ability to have in primary care these elements of a family planning clinic, which was what we were doing on a key parati. And when we were putting this on to, together, we find out, and you're going to see that on the next slide, we'll go to the next slide and then we'll probably come back to this one. Thank you. So writing the grant for going system-wide, so we say, okay, so what are the what are the teens that we're serving in our in the hospital working as a safety net at Hennepin Healthcare? And it blew my mind away. And I wish I knew this 2007, right? Uh, look at that. So these are ambulatory adolescents coming in into our system. We have like eight ambulatory clinics and one mothership in the middle of downtown Minneapolis. 57, 56% of the adolescents coming to the ambulatory system were Latino in Minneapolis, and 29% were African American, and the rest, the rest, right? So that made us very clear that we were having in the house teens with no ability to be referred to any other clinic, that we needed to provide care where we, we, where we were, and that we needed to be equipped as if we were a family planning clinic. And so that's how, and we can go back to the other slide, so sorry. We brought these elements of a family planning clinic. And what we do, we change in pharmacy a, a workflow. We told pharmacy, um, pharmacy was one of our main partners and we told them, we showed the map. So we started with the why and say, it's not a question about if, it's a question of how. And they were so amazing that they kind of like, it was at that time, like sample medication were like changing regulations. So they help us create an effective system where we can treat patients, provide plan B in the clinic. So there's a during visit medication and there, there's take home medication where I can initiate pills and even give it that to them right there. I can give condoms and make plan B to a guy, right? We can get plan B to boys and, and females till 2012, or we can write a prescription that is confidential. So going two slides further, we can see between our successes. And as you can see, most of our patients are 12 to 26 year old. So th this is a, the, who we cover in general, 10 to, tw to 26 years, 70% of them are in Medicaid or have some other Medicaid paid plans. 72%, if you click, 72% of them are teenagers, 10 to 18, thank you. And 28% are young adults. Most of our teens are female, so 80%, almost and 20% male. And we reached last year to 700 uh, youth. We have six outreach events. We were aware, we were able to give like 70% 
of family planning method services were tier one or tier two level method. And we're very proud of that. And 70% of the encounter included STI screening. We talk about the Between Us Health um, Talcam uh, website, and we are planning the next expansion to the ED urgent care. I wanted to show you very briefly some study. It, it's a study that we did, and it's about, it's, we did it with a keeper at tier, right? But this study was done during that period, 2010 and 2014, that we were the only one using this healthcare electronic medical record initiative modifications and having that ability to be a primary care converted into family planning care. So, and we looked into those groups 10 to 24 year old and we compare with all, with all everyone in Hennepin healthcare, right? That's the beauty of having an electronic healthcare record. And if you look into the next slide, let's look first into adolescents, right? And we use propensity score match, which is sort of like doing a random mind study, right? And what we find out, these are actual percentages that when you look at contraception, a keeperity against all other patients, we increase contraception prescriptions, meaning pills, depo, to 17% more than the rest, and 14 more than all the other Latino teens. But we increase LARC prescription, 10% more for all, and 10% more, again, for all Latinos. While we were having a parent on the other room. And to me, this is mind blowing and very important to share that with the field, because to me, the message goes, you can do family centered confidential care, because one doesn't interfere with the other. And then we can show you kind of like the same for young adults that the results are even higher, like 30% more, particularly LARCs, and 20% better contraception against all and against Latino. And I think that reflects the fact that when you are trained and when you're a champion, the outcomes are better. And with that, I'll thank you so, so much for this opportunity to share. And I welcome, you can send me any questions and you can send us um, request and here is an email to meet us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the exciting work that you all are doing. And um, like I said, if you have questions, you can type them into the question box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and if you want to send them via email, feel free to do that as well. So, oh, and there's the contact information. <laughs> um, our next presenter is Jonathan Fanberg. Um, who is a pediatrician and adolescent medicine specialist who has worked in Maine for over 20 years, seeing children, adolescents, and young adults. Presently, he is the director of the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at the Maine Medical Center. Along with seeing patients, he works with school health, substance use, adolescent gynecology, eating disorders, and resident and attending education. He is also on the executive committee for the section on adolescent health for the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I um, hunted him down via the SAM listserv to come and present on a little bit more about what they've done on their EMR in Maine. So Jonathan, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Kelly. So I'm at May Medical Center, which is the flagship hospital for about 14 hospitals in Southern Maine. And so what we do with our electronic medical record here affects 14, 13 other hospitals at the same time. Uh, so we have impact. Um, about three years ago, we became really frustrated with electronic medical records because of the lack of adolescent confidentiality. We weren't alone out there in the U.S. I wasn't finding anything on listservs and meetings I was attending. And so me and a couple others sat down and said, what can we do with what we have? Uh, we found this hotshot programmer um, who helped us along the way, and we developed some adaptations for our electronic medical record, which is epic. And although it's a local solution and there's no master switch you can turn on if you happen to have epic, um, it says it's doable, and we felt like we broke the sound barrier a, bit, a little bit along doing that. Next slide, please. We set the bar really high and for this hotshot programmer, and we said we want a tool that can be used infrequently by people who don't see adolescents all the time. It's really easy to use um, and memorize. It could be used halfway through a visit so we don't have to go back out to the front desk and say, make me a second visit or encounter, things like that. 
and we want to be able to use it for part of the visit or just the entire visit, uh, whatever it might be. Um, we want to maintain the confidentiality leaks that were already established in our system at the billing level and medical records level, laboratory, pharmacy, front desk, referrals. We had case examples of all these things. That was part of what motivated our system to address this. And we want to make um, other chart users aware that the information is confidential without blocking them from seeing the critical information. So if someone's going to go see an orthopedic surgeon, they would know that the girl was on birth control when not, not out or at the same time. And so we're really trying to protect the information from being disclosed to the parent and not other providers. Next, please. Um, so if you have Epic, this can be familiar to you, what I'm going to talk about. If you don't, it's still useful, but less um, identifiable, I guess. We developed two core tools at the core of our confidentiality, and we had to keep it simple, so we said two tools, nothing more. Um, in our system, we call it dot adolescent confidential. We developed a smart phrase to put within notes. And in our system, we develop a smart set, which is adolescent confidential by name. As it turns out in our system, if you even type the word adolescent, that by itself brings up these two tools because nothing else has been labeled it as it. Next slide, please. These tools I want to dig down farther. Um, the first of those tools was the adolescent confidential smart phrase. And what it does, it puts a little box within the note and anything written within that note becomes confidential. Anything outside the note, outside that box, is not confidential. And so you could put that box over your entire note, or you could put just over parts of your note. But what it does is it tells release of information people that things within that box are confidential. It also tells the viewers of that chart, uh, such as the orthopedic surgeon or somebody else, um, that whatever's in that box is confidential. And they should be aware of the information, but they shouldn't spill the beans when the patient's in the office. Um, this is very different from something called sensitive note that you might be familiar with in Epic, where you have a right to push a sensitive note button, and then nobody outside your department can see the note. And that's a problem in our system for these type of things in my mind. Next slide, please. The second tool we developed was the adolescent smart set for orders, and that's similar to what you heard at Hennepin County. Um, it's a smart set that automatically suggests to for teenagers between age 12 and 17, and it can be used selectively for the things that you want to keep confidential. So if I put an order in the smart set for chlamydia, okay, um, under, under the confidential smart set, it'll trigger a bunch of different things, or I can order a regular order such as chlamydia under regular ordering set and that would not be confidential. Next slide, please. By using that smart set, lots of things are triggered and that's what we like about it. Um, it contains um, messaging for uh, medical records that there's information within the chart that's confidential. It puts a little note on the schedule uh, saying that there's something about confidential for the checkout, sheet, uh, checkout staff that they should be aware of and an icon pops up in the schedule itself. Next, please. It provides opportunity for lots of orders to be ordered, and specifically one can order medications, labs, imaging, referrals, all within the smart set. Now, I admit this is a limited list of medications, but they're the top 20, 30, 50 medications out there as far as options, and it's a limited list of uh, imaging, such as pelvic ultrasound, or limited list of labs which are applicable. And most of those labs in medications and imaging are all covered under state laws as far as being able to provide them confidentially. Um, and it marks these orders as confidential. And so all the end users on the far end will get notations saying that order is confidential and they better be careful what they do with the information. And that includes both the pharmacy, the laboratory, the radiology, the referral queue people. Um, so are all familiar, at least when we order it, it uh, should be confidential. Next slide, please. With laboratories, um, we did special things. So if you order a chlamydia test under a confidential order or non-confidential order system now, it asks you, what do you want to do with the result when it comes back? And that gives me a little spot when I'm ordering the order at the time when the patient's sitting there next to me saying, what am I going to do with this order? Give me your cell phone or give me your boyfriend's cell phone or I can tell your brother but not your mom or things like that. And I can type whatever messaging that is in there. And the result itself pops up two things. One is this yellow type of flagging saying, this, this result's confidential, pay attention. 
but also, um, which doesn't show on the slide, it also pops up, what should I do with the order? So my nurse can actually call back the order with the number with confidence and recognize it might not be the main number that's listed in the chart, but it's a very specific related to that exact lab itself. Next slide, please. Um, for after visit summary, that piece of paper that you walk away with at the end of the day, it triggers a separate different after visit summary. It's been dumbed down. Um, anything that was listed as confidential, such as medica medications and labs, they don't appear in the after visit summary. Um, the diagnosis um, does not appear in the after visit summary if you chose confidential diagnosis. Uh, but that section that's called patient instructions will still appear. So you can have something that's very specific to the patient still get all the way through. And for the exit process, they still have a piece of paper that they're walking out with, so they feel like everybody else who's walked in and out of the office. Um, all the diagnoses that are used um, under the confidential order set show up in the diagnosis list as with the markings next to it saying they're confidential, and the same with the medications that are uh, marked in that setting. Next slide, please. And then with billing, we also realized we needed to do something. So any orders that are placed within the Alice and Confidential Smart Set are separated out from the orders that are not placed in the ILS and confidential smart set. Um, presently, we're writing those off um, and that's how we're dealing with it. But it allows us to take a well fiscal and maintain the bill and capture the bill from the well fiscal, yet um, take the chlamydia test that was obtained as part of the well fiscal and write that piece off. And it also allows us to capture any orders that would have been put in under regular orders um, and capture the billing from that. We've only had this since November. It took us two and a half years to get it live. Um, it, we have some early data coming out. It, this confidential order set's been used 56 times by 20 providers. Some used it a little more than others. We're trying to analyze that. Uh, most of the use has been related to labs, specifically chlamydia testing. Um, a number of providers have used adolescent confidential box, and we're trying to determine should that be in every teenager for the heads piece. Uh, that sensitive piece or should it just be on some where they care about the sensitivity. Uh, one thing we learned through the process, we developed a little pocket cart that has these little tools on it for the, the infrequent user um, so they know the, the tools, how to reach them as well. And next slide. We had some unexpected findings over, along the way. Um, we noticed that this order set was being used people over age 18 and so we actually uh, blocked it so they could not be using it on the older than age 18 people, mainly for billing purposes, but also because we felt like those people already had confidentiality maintained through our EMR. Uh, we want to shift some of the relocation of who's doing the guarantor adjustments from our front desk to a billing office that's done more routinely. Uh, we recognize that there were some automatic notification calls that were going out from our offices saying your appointment's tomorrow, which we had to adjust. And we also recognize pharmacies have a risk for that as far as we might send a medication uh, prescription to a pharmacy that says keep this confidential, yet their robocalls are going out saying your medication's ready. Um, to that extent, we are trying to identify a single pharmacy at our hospital that we can send uh, the prescriptions to with confidence that um, it'll be treated uh, confidentially. And we also recognize we need to look closer at some things like med refill processes and how that works into the MR. Uh, these tools were developed specifically for outpatient ambulatory care in our system, but and we think they're probably good for emergency room and inpatient care, but we have not tested that to the same extreme. Um, we uh, realize we need to figure out how to enter historical medications or problems in the med list without having to open up a whole new encounter. And we want to maximize billing where we can maintain the confidentiality. So that's about all I have to say about uh, what we're doing in Maine. Great. Thank you so much. And you had a couple of questions roll in for you throughout your presentation. So um, after this next piece, we'll circle back to those. Um, so our final panelist for the day is Dr. Joanna Brown, Clinical Associate Professor of Family Medicine at Brown, is, um, is a primary care physician and adolescent medicine specialist from Rhode Island. She, is cur she currently serves as a medical director at Well One Primary Medical and Dental Care and teaches about adolescent health and primary care at Brown's Family Medicine Residency. Adolescent confidentiality and consent has long been an interest of hers. She's co-chair of the Rhode Island Health Privacy Alliance, a coalition focused on eliminating breaches of confidentiality that incur with insurance explanation of benefits. Thank you so much. Um, 
I, uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you all today and to be a part of this important panel. Um, we've heard about really wonderful work being done on the clinical level to uh, preserve adolescent confidentiality. And um, I'm gonna shift towards the advocacy and policy realm. Um, I'd like to give some background on um, the explanation of benefits issue and then talk a bit about um, what we've been doing in Rhode Island. So um, next slide. So um, explanations of benefits actually serve an important role. So we've heard about them already. There are these statements that you get from the insurance company um, that detail services provided, um, you know, money covered, money owed. They often say this is not a bill at the top. Um, and they protect insurers and policyholders from fraud and promote transparency about services and inform policyholders of charges. So again, a really important role in terms of transparency. However, um, they can have really um, serious effects on confidentiality for adolescents, young adults, and others, because um, typically, um, if you're a dependent on someone else's insurance, you're not a policy holder. Um, your EOB, your explanation of benefits, goes to the policy holder, and this can, can include um, all kinds of information, such as laboratory testing, um, you know, health services, physical therapy services often listing the name of the service provider. Um, this tends to be more of an issue for private health insurance. Um, a lot of Medicaid programs um, don't send EOBs home. Next slide. So the Affordable Care Act was this wonderful boon for uh, health insurance for young adults. Um, uh, young adults, as, as you're probably familiar, can remain on their parents' insurance plans until age 26. Um, and between the years of 2010 and 2013, we know that 2.3 million young adults gained coverage, and that as of 2013, 50 million young adults were on their parents' insurance. So amazing for health, health coverage. However, um, now we have this whole group for whom there can be uh, breaches of confidentiality with EOBs in addition to adolescents and other folks who um, are on someone else's on someone else's health plan. Um, now you would think, you know, HIPAA is all about healthcare privacy. Um, however, there is uh, there's an exception with HIPAA um, that it's okay to disclose PHI um, without patient authorization when required for payment. Um, now there, you know, there is some allowance for for patients who want to want uh, confidentiality. Um, you can request to suppress an EOB, um, have it sent or received elsewhere, if it could potentially endanger the patient. Um, so this is something from HIPAA, but it's definitely not enough. Um, there's nothing that says that insurance companies have to honor that request. Um, the term endanger really needs to be interpreted and um, maybe doesn't afford enough protection. Um, so a number of states have, have come in and um, worked on this issue to really um, protect uh, the confidentiality of um, patients with respect to EOB. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Um, so again, um, populations that can be affected um, by breaches of confidentiality with EOB, um, certainly adolescents, um, young adults, and also um, another population is spouses, which can mean spouses and those who might be victims of domestic violence. Um, and so, you know, revelation of confidential information can pose a risk to safety. And then, um, you know, as, as has been alluded to in, um, in the uh, presentations we've, we've already heard, um, people may avoid needed care as important public health information. Um, next slide. Uh, this is just a sample uh, explanation of benefits. Um, I think we can go on to the next slide. So uh, about two years ago, um, uh, I got together with another um, physician, Dr. Jack, Jack Rusley, and uh, who became uh, my co-chair for the Rhode Island Health and Privacy Alliance. And we started talking to um, some folks in the Department of Health um, who 
So do I see it? Julian, uh, your yeah. audio is going in and out a little bit. I'm not sure if you can uh, no. know if that was better reception or <laughs> is that a little better? I think so. Thanks. Okay. All right, I'll keep going. So anyway, um about a couple of years ago, um some of us got together and uh physicians, um public health folks, um and we started talking about the explanation that this is too and and thinking, you know, there's got to be a way that we can make things better for our patients in our diet. You know, our our uh, adolescent patients should not have to deal with the potential of having their cognitive value put away by an explanation of benefit. So um, we began to, to talk to other uh, public health professionals. Um, we teamed up with physician groups um, and uh, college health folks. Nonprofits working on issues such as um, domestic violence, reproductive health, substance abuse, and we built this coalition. Um, and uh, we began doing a lot of fact finding, uh, really exploratory work at the beginning, um, meeting with stakeholders, um, presenting to insurance medical directors, finding out what the various insurances in Rhode Island were doing with respect to EOBs. Um, uh, presenting to college health and um, and uh, talking to the health insurance commissioner's office as well, and we um, hooked up with advocates in other states. And then, lo and behold, a state representative last year um, submitted a bill in the legislative session. And interestingly, her perspective was um, really wanting to protect women in domestic violence. Um, next slide. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the team consent law, except to say that any law that um, it would be passed in Rhode Island would be consistent with um, what uh, what is already in place. In terms of that um, next next slide, please. So now I want to step back and talk about what some other states have done with respect to explanations. Um, several states have worked on this, have passed laws. Colorado has passed a law, California passed a law a few years ago. And um, I would suggest that if you haven't already checked it out, that you take a look at their website, My Health, My Info. It um, really has some wonderful information for patients and, um, and really tries to you know, lead patients by the hand through the process of getting, um, of, of making sure that they're, uh, that their uh, EOB communication is confidential. So they can fill out a specific confidential communications request form, and then there's a script that they can use if they are calling their health insurance company, and they can also confirm that um, the form was received and that their information is protected. So this is one example of how a state has addressed the EOB issue and how providers can help their patients. Uh, go through this process. Um, next slide. So another state um, that has done tremendous work on uh, explanation of benefits is Massachusetts. Massachusetts passed a law just last year called the Patch Act, or Protect Access to Confidential Health Care. Um, they had a, a very broad-based coalition working on the issue, and um, their law had uh, several key elements. And Rhode Island, we really modeled our bill um, after the Massachusetts law. So um, here are the key elements. The summary, summary of payment form can go directly to the insured dependent. So in our case, uh, in our discussion, it could be that are a uh, young adult, um, not to the policyholder. Um, patients can choose how they want to receive the information. It can be accessed in any of compliant electronic way or a different mailing address. Um, the EOB would not describe sensitive services. Instead, um, any uh, any sensitive services would be masked in general terms like office visit. And then um, patients can opt out of having um, a summary of payment or EOB sent at all if there is uh, no cost sharing, if there's no balance on the claim. Um, and then certainly a part of this uh, this this law is lots and lots of education and awareness. 
for patients and providers. Um, next up, a slide. So um, back to the Rhode Island story. Um, as I said, um, you know, we have um, now modeled our um, our proposed uh, uh, bill. We our language we borrowed from um, Massachusetts. Um, so after last year's uh, legislative session, um, our coalition continued to work, and um, and then we collaborated with um, state legislators. And um, the Healthcare Accessibility and Quality Assurance Act um, was introduced early in the session, both um, on the House side and on the Senate side. Um, and there were hearings um, in the House Committee on Health, Education, and Welfare, and the Senate Committee on Health and Social Services, um, and uh, uh, really exciting hearings with um, you know, lots and lots of written and oral testimony um, from advocates, from the ACLU, from from medical society, from from all kinds of um, nonprofits, um, and then uh, since then, um, both bills are, are in committee, um, and uh, there have been meetings among um, stakeholders, among legislators, insurers, state government agencies, and um, and ne negotiations are currently in place. Um, and in the meantime, our uh, our RIPA coalition um, continues to meet and to advocate. And, um, and we're hopeful that we will um, have a um, solution in the near future. Um, and I really wanted to you know, share this story so that um, people in other states um, you know, may not have these protections for adolescents and young adults with respect to EOBs to see that you really can advocate um, and you Get to the state house. You can work on legislation. You can meet with insurers and and really um, uh, work to make things better. Um, so next slide. Um, so just a few other notes about um, implementation, um, because you can you can you know pass legislation and then the question is um, what um, what's next? Um, there are different ways of doing it and. Uh, you know, there is a question as to whether there should be automatic masking of sensitive codes, uh, as we saw in, in how some other states have addressed it. Should it have, should the work happen mainly um, in the setting of the patient visit? Should it be um, on the patient to contact the insurer? Um, should EOBs be automatically suppressed? And who's responsible for making it happen? So. All of these things are, are questions that come in when you try to figure out uh, how to make this work um, and how to make sure that our, um, our patients can get um, private and confidential. So thank you so much and I'll look forward to speaking any questions. Great, thank you so much for sharing the, the policy perspective. I think sometimes we miss that piece and when we're so in the weeds. So I really appreciate you sharing that. So now we have um, an opportunity for questions. I do have a few in the queue. So I'll start with this one and um, all of our panelists, feel free to jump in if you have something to share. I'm gonna unmute all of our, our panelists now, um, if possible. Oh, you'll have to unmute yourself um, if you have uh, self-muted. So the question is, um, what uh, the, the person would love um, any confidential workflow tips for offices that don't use EPIC or I'll say for offices who have any type of EMR that haven't gotten to the place that you all have in, in Maine or in Minnesota. <laughs> I feel I should be answering it, but I don't have a good answer. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> that, this is the frustration I have for years. Um, you know, you limit how much you put in the medical records, what it comes down to. Um, and th th that's the piece. I mean, th there's some side th tips. You know, if you have point of care testing for pregnancy testing, you do in your office. And the question is, how do you document that? that? and you don't bill it. Um, you write a prescription on a piece of pa paper prescription instead of electronic prescription, tell the kids to take to different pharmacy that their regular insurance is not and pay cash. Um, 
th those are not ideal solutions, but they're some of the t tricks that you learn to get around this. So here in Minnesota, I'm muted. So the question is like how to do this without the EHR modifications? Right. Uh, so you can create a documentation only uh, part, kind of like or note, and I will use that. It's not ideal, right? But at least if you want to document something that is not going to be shared with the patient through the release of records, you can do that. But then it's the same, all the same. Um, there's no many options. For us, our hands were tied. We were not able to write paper prescription and we're, we are not allowed to write paper prescriptions anymore. So I will say that refer is the only thing. And by the way, through the referral piece, that's how we were able to convince Epic from Hennepin that we need to filter the ABS. Uh, for you guys also in, in other states to use that, because they were saying like, well, we don't want to filter information in the VA because someone can go to a different healthcare system and then they will have like a, a filter list of uh, medications. And so our reply to them was like, one, I don't think any provider in any healthcare system will rely on an ABS, right? Will, will re request the records. But the other piece is like, that's what we are doing right now anyway, because we have created this subsystem of clinic, underground clinic, right? Like it's not connected with our main primary care health record and patients are being treated there and we don't know it. And we cannot incorporate that information. Um, so we are always going to have a, like an a, like a incomplete list of medication if we don't fix the problem. And I think that, that was the kind of like winning argument for us. And they allow us in our ABS, it, it, there's, there's some language saying like some information might, might have been filtered. It, it doesn't say confidential or, but so that there's that blur there that hopefully no one makes much of it. And, but I think it's important to remember that. Hey, Kaylee, I, I chased my last qu comments with the fact that the majority of the time you can involve a parent with a kid's care. And we should always focus on that piece also, that, that involving families is the ideal setting. It's the rare setting where you really have to get full confidentiality. Uh, Great, thanks for that. Um, I have a question here on thoughts about how to use these approaches for mental or behavioral health care. You know, everyone, well, go ahead. I, I I was just going to jump in on that. I think you will have to first take a look at what your state consent laws are regarding mental and behavioral health care. Here in Arizona, for example, mental health screenings and mental health interventions for um, adolescents are not permissible without parents' consent. Great. So I'll say here, like, it gets a little easy, right? Um, if you have a hybrid visit, meaning like you have pieces that are confidential and pieces that are not confidential, to do that because you can record the confidential piece, like in the note, you, you don't have, and then build for the whole time to the main, maybe to the main note or to the main appointment, the, we, you don't have many labs or medication, right? And I'm not quite sure, I think like in most of the state, if you go to medication, that's a blurry line, right? That's when you, when you start thinking, like, you need to, I, I believe, like, for most state, you need to involve the parents. So mainly there are not so many labs or, or medication to be paid. So it gets a little easy to protect. But I haven't explored that in full mm -hmm. yet. We've had a little bit of an opposite problem with mental health. So if a provider sees the majority of mental health, their, their notes are very confidential. They're too confidential. <laughs> The primary, care yeah. right, the, the primary care provider can't get access to them half the time and they end up having to send them by snail mail to, just so they get access. But... I agree. So next question, Dr. Fanberg, is for you. The question is, can anyone chart a confidential note in the EMR or are physicians the only ones that can chart a confidential note? We set the tool up so anybody can use it. Literally a secretary at the front desk or a nurse or a physician or a counselor or anybody, so. Great. And is that just in the way that it's set up? So you might have to change a setting if you have it set that way currently for others? Well, it was, 
it was built as a smart phrase and anybody can do smart phrases. And so okay. that, that's the trigger behind it. Got it. Great. Um, again, going to confidential lab testing. So how do you ensure that the lab that is processing the testing, like a chlamydia test, is also billed as confidential? The person says that they collect the specimen in the clinic, but send it off to a lab to have it run by the lab. So that is in our system as well, where we collect it in our clinic or we collect it at the lab. It goes to the same lab um, for both locations. Uh, we did have to retrain our lab and that stalled us for about six months to make sure that they were trained adequately. Um, the biggest thing was the order itself was marked confidential. So that was one alert to them. The second piece is the results marked confidential and that was the second alert. Um, so if a parent called the lab directly or for some reason, they might wouldn't get the result. Uh, and then from billing standpoint, that's the tricky piece. Okay, so we want to bill where we can keep confidentiality and we're willing to forgo and suck up the bill where we can't keep confidentiality. In our system, our entire lab network is actually owned by the same main health system. So we have a little bit of control of what they bill and what they don't bill. Um, we're not quite sure whose um, uh, account that's being charged to at the moment, whether it's the office or the hospital or the, actually the lab. Um, and that's one piece that'll probably come down the pipeline. Uh, but if, if they have Medicaid, we know we can maintain confidentiality. So we want that bill still to go completely through. If they have a private insurance, um, we're not sure we can maintain it. So we're willing to suck up that piece of the visit without losing the rest of the visit. So here from Minnesota, um, we can like do the same. And particularly in the generation of the labs. It was training from the lab. And, and I think what the, the lab director is one of our most amazing champions ever. And so it generates even a different uh, label. So the label is confidential. So the order is marked confidential. The label is confidential. And then the lab, it generates something to the lab, like they're not going to send the results to, to the patients or the family. And, and for us, again, the, the cost, we couldn't keep it. We didn't have the luxury of keeping the cost um, at, kind of like, because we are on a safety net and we wanted to protect also the safety net. But we were lucky enough to find this amazing, amazing family planning special project grant that allow us to do that. And what we are doing with Medicaid is the same. We now created a workflow where we send everything to Medicaid and we have a grant sort of like a, the second guarantor waiting. If like someone is get rejected, that's when we get the cost and that allow us to save a lot of money but at the beginning we were not quite sure so we started like in the safe zone and building all the having our guarantor our grant as a guarantor for all of that it creates multiple complications right like we were talking on the listser um with dr fango about that like for us it's creating two encounters so we have a workflow and now we're going to try we are trying to get away from the two encounters um and maybe creating a link in the smart set that triggers directly to build and we take care of the guarantor, but it's all on the works. You all are making me think about the fact that all of the work that all of you have spoken about today requires a huge amount of buy-in from a lot of different folks involved in your site or, you know, at the policy level. Could each of you speak a little bit about how you've been able to get that buy-in to move forward with these um, these innovative ideas? That's been a reality in Maine and that's what took us three years. Uh, yeah. When I had a cohort of people and enough index cases of breaching confidentiality, that's what created buy-in in part. Um, we have great buy-in for this piece, but we didn't talk about my chart and electronic access to your own medical record. We have no buy-in in that moment. The lawyers are holding stuff, at least locally. Um, and I'm, I'm envious of other systems that have 12-year-olds who can see their chart. So. Mm. We did a presentation uh, with Joanna. Um, <laughs> and, and, guys, and the Adolescent Health Initiative, right? The three of us. So can, remember? The three of us, we did a presentation at Sam, it was one of in the Institute and it was amazing and it was sort of like talking about system wide adolescent health initiative, right? And in that kind of like we reflected at the end that uh, it's all about advocacy, it's all about framing and framing the issue correctly. And if there's some uh, some 
physicians or, or providers or healthcare provider that can do this, it's us. It's people working with adolescents because we, we know not innovational interviewing, right? So for one, we, all, we need to own that. But sometimes it's daunting when you're going to this task. But it's all about framing. It's all about um, relationship and ones that, and, and it's starting with the why. And when people hear the why loud and clear, they they, trans, they get transformed, and then they, they're champions on itself. So it, it's been transformative for us to see how um, people hear. It, it, it was also kind of like you need to build a relationship one to one because they go to they start reflecting about their own child and how come they didn't have that or their own self. So it is fascinating so and it takes time but it's worthy yeah and it really does make a difference. Um, you know, here at phoenix children's hospital we've, we've been able to get buy-in for some but uh, there certainly are drop-offs we have confidential note types that don't migrate to the portal confidential note types that don't um that aren't released to parents but we haven't really found buy-in at the portal level and we still have automatically populating problem lists and automatically populating navigation lists and it really just takes persistence. Um, just speaking at the coalition building, um, I think one of the metrics for um, was um, the need for reach beyond adolescent health at this time. So in other words, this is like our coalition, let's get right to wait a minute. Um, you know, be, you know, they affect the adults, they are college students avoiding STD testing, not getting trapped because of the system. Um, they are social Can, can everyone hear, Joanna? I have trouble. Still yeah, not yeah oh. your audio is still not great. <laughs> pause there. I just don't think that we can um, hear you very well. And so sorry about that, everyone. But, um, we'll, we'll maybe have you type in um, anything else that you want to add so that we can share that with the whole audience. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, I heard you saying networking and you know, getting buy-in from other folks. And those are kind of some of those small pieces that I caught. But um, yeah, thank you all for speaking to that because I know that this work is it requires a lot of advocacy within your systems and within your communities and within your state. Um, and that's really a key piece of it. Um, we have a little bit of time left. I'm just gonna ask a couple more of these practical questions here that I got. Um, are there any CPT codes that an office can use in, um, instead of the STD tests, pregnancy tests, et cetera? And again, I'm assuming this is for a system that doesn't have those great systems already in place where they can code all those things as confidential. I'm not sure what codes you would use as alternatives for lab testing. However, for, for visits, you can certainly use non-specific things like um, fatigue or general abdominal pain or something like that. 
Um, and this tend to work for almost anything out there. <laughs> We do the same, but I believe like AAAP have like a list of codes, right? I haven't seen that in a while, but they have like a, a very a resource with list of codes that you can use for confidentiality that doesn't trigger main identifiers somehow. Dr. Chilani, are you aware of any codes for for lab tests that folks can kind of use as a workaround? No, no, I'm not. But but I do agree with what Dr. Sandberg was saying about symptom-based coding. And personally, when I even when I have young people with diagnosed with um, you know gonococcal cervicitis, I, I, I don't indicate in their problem this gonococcal cervicitis. I say cervicitis or urethritis because I'm mindful of 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 how visible some of these problems might be to others in the system. And Dr. Fanberg, this question I think is for you as well. Um, the person is saying that they use a smart form for the head's history taking. Is it possible to make a smart form confidential in the system that you use? I'm not familiar with the smart, uh, vaguely familiar with the smart form and not enough to tell you that answer. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> I know like the social piece on Epic so far is built to be shareable and that's an issue. And we okay. have we work internally to divide kind of like, that you can that you we should have like two pieces of of this social history and one that is confidential that should remain confidential and the other piece that is more broad and can be shared but so far so i don't go there i don't put many stuff there because i know like it's shareable with everyone mm -hmm. and that's an issue right great well, that was one of our last questions. There was a few we didn't get to, um, but I'll try to follow up with those folks um, via email as well. So thank you so much to our panel for taking this time to share what you're doing with us. This has um, been great learning um, for me and hopefully for our audience as well. Um, just a reminder to folks that you could check out all of AHI's resources on our website, adolescenthealth.org, adolescenthealthinitiative.org. And, um, from there, you'll be receiving a follow-up email from me that includes the, a PDF version of these slides. And uh, I have a couple of notes for folks to follow up with. Um, and feel free to contact me with any additional questions. You will also receive an email from GoToWebinar within the hour that asks you to complete a short, short evaluation of the webinar today. So thank you all so much. And we um, hope to sh uh, talk with you again soon.